Happy 2021, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here at About Trout, I do fly fishing how-tos, gear reviews, tying stuff, um, and I'm sure I'm missing some other things, but it's great. Spend your time here. Anyway, today's video is how to plan a flow trip. And the reason I'm making this video is because the current state of affairs, I think a lot of us have found ourselves with some extra free time, maybe some extra cash, and I'm seeing a lot more boaters and new boaters out in the water. So this video is how to plan a flow trip. And I hope this helps. You just have to understand that all rivers are gonna be different. There's nuance to everything. And I'm gonna paint with as broad brush strokes as possible. If I miss something, let me know in the comments below and I'll address that. So let's just uh, dive right into it. So before we get this video popping, you wanna familiarize yourself with a couple basic river terms, right? Um, let's just keep it basic, basic. River left, river right. That's the first two you should know. When you're floating down a river, and on every single river, when you're looking down river, your left-hand side is river left, your right-hand side is river right. That doesn't change when you face upstream. River left is still gonna be the downstream left side, and likewise with river right. If you get confused when you're looking down the river, just make the little L's and this makes an L for left, river left, river right, boom, you're good to go. Um, if you don't know what down river means, it means downstream. With the flow, up river is against the flow. Downstream, upstream, up river, down river. So good things to know. Um, on top of that, the other thing you wanna familiarize yourself with is CFS, that means cubic feet a second. That is how flow is measured. And why is that important? Well, that's gonna really dictate your day. Um, at, on some rivers, you can't float them at a certain CFS. And on some rivers, it's too high and dangerous on another, at the other end of the spectrum. At higher water, the hazards are the water and the waves. At low water, the hazards are all the rocks that are exposed. Little so understanding a river's flow and understanding what a good floating flow and even what a good fishing flow is are really, really important. I made a video on CFS, I'll post it right here. It's my least watched video on the channel, but I think it's one of the most important videos I've ever made. It's one of my first videos, so enjoy it, laugh, all right? But CFS, think of it as a one CFS is about the size of a basketball. So 100 CFS would be like 100 liquid basketballs coming down the river. Now CFS isn't the same, doesn't mean the same thing on different rivers, right? So like 100 CFS on a little creek that you fish is a huge flow. On a river like the Columbia in Washington, that would be an ecological crisis uh, because it's a bigger, broader river, right? So just having an understanding of that. The best way to do that would be to talk to a local fly shop or a guide service in the area that could tell you what the river's floatable range is. The other thing to consider when planning your float is what type of boat do you have? Do you have a drift boat or do you have a raft? Why is that important? Because when you're talking to somebody about floating and going back to CFS, usually everything that you can run in a drift boat, you can run in a raft, but not vice versa. Rafts are gonna be better at lower flows. At a lower flow, you can really beat up your drift boat, you can put holes in it, you can really end the day. Whereas a raft, you can kind of pinball off the obstructions and all is good in the world. So knowing what a raft flow is versus a drift boat flow is, is something really important when researching what float you wanna do. And we're gonna double tap on CFS a little bit later in this video, but those are just some quick terms to understand. And then knowing river left and river right are gonna help you when someone's describing potential obstacles and hazards. They might say, hey, look out for this rock on river left. So it's kind of good to know where river left is. The big, big thing with rowing, especially if you're a new rower, is you have to be really honest with your rowing abilities. My dad just bought me this boat last week, but I've seen somebody row before, I'll be fine. I've definitely been on floats where I've maxed out my rowing ability that I probably shouldn't have done. And I was happy to be with a buddy who had run really big whitewater to get us through what would have been some trip ending situations. I've also floated with people that said that they could row, and next thing I know, I'm underwater looking at my boat. I mean, I've only flipped a boat like half a dozen times. So thank God I had my PFD on, and I can't stress that enough. Be super honest with your rowing ability and have your safety equipment. Accidents happen, 
even on the most simple floats. All it takes is hitting one rock, a bump, you're not paying attention. So please, please, please wear that stuff. But hey, if you don't want to, live your truth. All right, you have an idea of what a river's floatable range is. Um, you are honest with your rowing ability. It's gonna be a good fit for you. Now, how do you start to plan the process? Well, the first thing you have to figure out is where you're gonna put your boat in and where you're gonna take out. So the put in is where you put the boat in and the take out is where you get it at the end of the day. Simple enough. What's gonna dictate your length of float is what put in you use, what take out you use, and generally floats are named by the put into the takeout. So for example, if I'm on the San Juan and I'm talking to a buddy, hey, I did T-hole to Crusher today, or I did Crusher to Village, that lets them know the float that I did, and that's how most people are going to describe the float to you, by the put in and the takeout name, this to this. So something to consider. Also, you need to consider what's gonna make your float longer or shorter, right? So. Going back to CFS, if it's a higher flow, the river is going faster, which means it's gonna move your boat faster. So on a higher water flow, it's gonna be a quicker float. If it's lower and slower or shallower, it's gonna be a longer day. Generally, if you're not dropping, if you're dropping anchor or you're not dropping anchor, a six to eight mile float is going to take about eight hours, depending on how much you drop anchor. Um, on the San Juan, for example, it's a really short float. It's just over three miles, so you can really be off that river quick. But by dropping anchor and fishing and running laps, you can also make it a 10 hour day. So things to consider. It's a real, it's a real the one. other thing to consider if you're doing a float is if it's even legal for you to drop anchor. Public, private, does it matter? This is all Jaws water. I think we can drop anchor here. My dad knows this guy. Just saying that you know the property owner or it's your brother's cousin's friend, that's not gonna cut it. You, some states, you have to have written permission to do that. New Mexico is one of them. And some states, you can drop anchor wherever you want and get out on the bank and have a party. So, you know, you have to double check those laws. I use an app called OnX Hunt, and it's great because I can download a map of my float before I go on the trip. I have an offline capability to see where I am on the river in real time, and it also denotes public and private property, which is great when it's a lot of private water with intermittent public pieces. I know where I can take a break, where I can get out, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't recommend OnX enough. And it's also great if it's a float that I've never been on, I can double check Onyx and see how close I am to the takeout if I need to speed up the day or if I can just sit back and relax. So something I really suggest you guys checking out. The other thing with flow is just also time of year. I mean, a float that you do in the winter that's 10 miles with a good flow, you probably wouldn't want to do that in the winter if you have less daylight. So just consider your time of year. Just because you did it in the summer and it was great doesn't mean it's going to take that amount of time in the winter with a lower flow and with less light. The last thing you want to be doing is rowing through the dark in freezing temperatures. You've matched a river to your rowing ability. You uh, understand the floatable range. You know what put out you're gonna take, you know what put in you're gonna use, and you know what takeout you're gonna use. The other thing you wanna do is triple, triple check your obstructions, rapids, if there's diversion dams. I cannot stress that enough. And the other thing you wanna consider is depending on the flow, some of those obstructions will be there and some of them won't. What that means is a little rapid that you did at a lower flow could be an absolute nightmare at a higher flow. So you always want to double check, especially if you're new to that float or especially if you're a new rower. Um, on top of that, you want to make sure that there's no hazards, no pinch points, no dams, no fences. I cannot stress triple checking enough with your friends, with your local fly shop, maybe with some guide services, if there are any things to be aware of. Um, one of the floats that I guide, it's not marked. And if you take a right turn, if you go river right, you're gonna get sucked into an irrigation ditch and good luck getting your boat out while everyone else makes fun of you. That is easily avoided if you just take the time to talk to people when planning your float. So I can't stress that enough. Not everything is marked. There are surprises, you know, things change by the week. Maybe a tree fell across the river. Check, check, check before you go. So again, can't stress that enough. So you have all of that put together, right? You put in your takeout 
about the amount of time it's gonna take, you've measured the length on Onyx, or you know it's an X mile float, you know it's a good CFS, you know there's no hazards, you're good. The last thing you need to consider is if you're gonna do use a shuttle service or if you're gonna self shuttle. All a shuttle means is how you're gonna get your car back at the end of the day. So a shuttle service is you go to the put-in, you call the shuttle driver, the shuttle service, you leave some cash, you lock a key somewhere, you hide it, whatever, you and your shuttle driver keep those secrets safe, and you just hop in the boat, go on your merry way, and at the end of your day, your car will be there at the takeout, your key will usually be locked in the vehicle or in your lockbox, and you're good to go. On the San Juan, my guy is Dave Hackis. Um, if you are out there a lot, you have a shuttle card. I just put it in my window. Dave knows where the key is and the boat is there at the end of the day. Dave is a great guy. He's also a great guide out in the San Juan and I'll put his information down below. Never had a problem. It's as easy as can be. So for the convenience factor, you can't beat a shuttle service. Um, some rivers do not have shuttle services and some are really expensive. Some only run certain times of the year, so that's something that you wanna check before you go on your float trip. The last float that I did, that shuttle service wasn't running when we were there, so we had to self-shuttle. When you self-shuttle, you need to decide if you're gonna put the trailer at the takeout at the, be or at the, takeout at the beginning of the day, or if you're gonna do it at the end of the day. We just dropped the trailers off. We're gonna hop in my car, run back to the top, and get this float on the road. I much, much prefer to do it at the beginning of the day. It just makes life a thousand times easier. So you dump your boat in. Usually you have a buddy stay with the boat at the put in. You and another car go down to the take out. You leave your trailer there, hop back in, drive to the top and you float. The reason that's great is because you don't have to wait for the trailer at the end of the day when it's cold, you're tired. So with that being said, you know, you can also just dump the boat in, have a car at the takeout, and then just run the trailer back at the end of the day. But usually by that time, you're tired, it's cold, you just want to go home. So kind of getting it out of the way early makes, usually it seems it, it usually it makes it just a more fluid process because once you trailer the boat, all of you can hop in the car, drive back in, day's done. So I hope that helps. I really tried to paint with as broad brush strokes as I can. Like I said, I know all rivers have nuances. There's other things to consider. There might be some laws where you can't float this section on a weekend. So double tap on your state and local laws. But thank you so much everybody for watching. If you have any questions, um, please leave them in the comments below. I have made plenty of mistakes. I'm not too proud to admit that. And I am happy to share with you some of those experiences in the comments and maybe help you avoid the same things. So I really appreciate everybody checking out this video. I hope you have an awesome time on your next float and I'll see you guys on the next video. Fist bump. Bye. When I'm floating through Colorado, sometimes I like to bring some camouflage. There's a lot of trust safari and guides around here, and if I blend in, they won't know I'm dropping anchor where I'm not supposed to be. <laughs>